Hi everyone! It's only a couple weeks until Halloween and so I've been wondering what you guys are going to do to celebrate Halloween this year. I know a lot of people are worried about not having very many trick-or-treaters this year with COVID and everything like that, but I hope that it's not a completely ruined holiday and that some of you are going to go and do some fun stuff or are still able or expecting to do some fun things. I unfortunately don't get to do much this year because I'm going to be flying um, back home from seeing my family. So unfortunately, my plane gets in a little later and I won't be able to do much to celebrate this year. I'm usually someone who likes to dress up and either hand out candy or, you know, see my friends. Last year, I definitely wore my costume to work and I, even though I was the only one wearing a costume at work, I really didn't care. I just enjoyed doing it. So... Unfortunately this year I'm out of luck for this holiday, but I'm hoping that you guys will still be able to take advantage and do something fun. Alright, I guess let's go ahead and get into today's class. Welcome back fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again and I hope you're doing well. Today's class we are going to be finishing up the end of Pawn of Prophecy, which is the first book in the Belgarid series. I hope those of you who are reading it for the first time are enjoying it, and those of you who are reading it again as you watch these, that you are enjoying it all over again and ending up to uh, relate to or experience new things that you didn't in previous reads. Um, so yep, we're doing chapters 16 all the way to the end. Hopefully you enjoyed it and are ready for book two, since that will be coming up afterward. And let's go ahead and get started with our recap as always. So we started off with this set of chapters after we ended with the boar hunt and this mysterious thing that happened with Barak that we aren't sure exactly what it is. So we see Garon take a day to rest. He's gone and seen by several people. They all compliment him, except for, of course, Mr. Wolf, who's a little harsh on him. But everybody else uh, is wishing him a speedy recovery, and in the end, he doesn't take that long to recover either. And he starts wandering around the castle once again while the adults talk. So he's wandering around, and then he ends up following the green cloaked man again he ends up seeing him and following him to see where he's going and they both overhear a conversation that's happening with the kings and Polgara and Belgareth uh, up in a higher level they can hear down below so he finally decides to tell somebody about the green cloaked man and finds Barak who is alone in his room after being shut up in his room and he tells Barak of the green cloaked man as well as the encounter he saw in the forest. Um, Amaro also is there when he is telling Barak this, so all three of them head over to the kings and their party that was discussing stuff and tells them of what is going on and what Garon has noticed and who they believe must be the lord that was in the forest hiring the green cloaked man. So everybody is now up to date. They're understanding what's going on uh, and they end up discovering that Garon has a spell on him by Asherak who has made it so he can't talk of the Murgo uh, that he knows as Asherak. And so Pole goes ahead and releases that spell off of him and he is able to say everything he needs to about him and finally is able to explain to, to everybody that he has been seeing this Murgo since he was a little boy. So they send him upstairs to get some rest, but unfortunately Asherak has infiltrated the castle with some of his people and is then chasing Garon. So he's running and running and ends up down a corridor that is once again able to look down on where everyone is talking. And he listens for a little while before letting them know that the letting them know that he is stuck up in this passageway and he cannot see. So they go ahead and hand him up a torch so he can get out and is found. Um, so after he is rescued and Asherak's men are dispersed from the castle, they didn't get Asherak himself. So they have a little bit more of a wrap up of their conversations, go ahead and set their plans, and then they are 
it's getting ready to sail out on their way. They get on the boats and are sailing away toward back toward Kamar so that they can continue their search for the thief that has not been named yet. And while they're sailing away, we end on this note of uh, Mr. Wolf and Garon talking, where uh, they establish some of Garon's past, as well as his links to both uh, Aunt Pole and Belgareth himself. So we end on a little bit of a, a, a tale of Garon's history, and we've kind of filled in not all of it, but a little bit of that chunk for him. So pretty interesting chapters. I felt like this particular section, even though we had an extra chapter, went by really quick. A lot of the uh, events really happened boom, 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 and then it was done and over. Um, so hopefully, again, you enjoyed this first book and are excited to read more. Um, I would like to go over a couple of points from these last couple chapters, and then as I always try to do, I'm going to go ahead and do a kind of a wrapping up of this book and uh, a setup for our next book and see what we can see or what we expect to see in the next coming book for ourselves. So let's go ahead and talk just a teeny tiny bit about world building because I do notice that there is some world building in this last little bit that we've got. Um, it's not a whole lot at this point because we are doing more of a climax with the um, chase from Asherak and everybody being all discombobulated in the palace but there is still a little bit of world building that we see with Barak and that's because he talks about his doom and we kind of left it off the last set of chapters where we just knew that Marchi had said your doom is coming when you go on this boar hunt and we saw that bear barack uh, kind of mixture and then we were wondering what that meant and he said that his doom is upon him and that chariots have something known as a doom and it doesn't necessarily mean death it just means something horrible is going to happen to, uh, to them and he was always told that his doom was going to be turning into a beast and he was just hoping it was never going to come. He tries to get Garon to say what beast he thinks he's going to turn into, but Garon keeps saying, oh no, oh no, he's trying to relay him by saying, that didn't happen, you're just delusional. Um, but it obviously seems that likely that he uh, will have some sort of relationship with this bear, whatever it is. Obviously, he didn't fully turn into a bear at this point. He's still himself at this moment. But his doom did come, and apparently it's a common thing in their society to have a doom and have it being predicted at birth. Which is very interesting because, you know, the Sendars don't have this. As far as we've seen, Garon's never heard of a doom. But Aunt Pole kind of, you know, when he talked to Aunt Pole, he was, it was not a surprise to her. So I wonder what makes the Cherry people have these things called doom, and... We're going to see how that affects Barak in the future because obviously he is still with their party. He is still sailing away with them. So he's going to continue on with whatever this doom ends up meaning. Or uh, we don't know what the progression is going to be of turning into this bear or what exactly it means. But we do know that apparently it's a common thing and it was said from his birth that he was going to turn into some kind of beast. We're going to see how that progresses and we're going to see if we see anybody else's doom or somebody who had a doom that is now complete uh, because I still don't really understand uh, too much about about what it actually means to have this doom and how that's going to progress. We'll see obviously like we just said with Barak and we're going to see if we meet anybody else that has had this happen to them. And then the second thing that we have that's kind of world building-ish is that we really hear about a prophecy. We don't know what the prophecy is, we don't know who it is or anything like that at this point, but we do hear that there is such a thing as a prophecy that, that could be fulfilled with what they are doing and how they are setting things up. So I find that rather interesting is that this world has magic and now we have the ability to have prophecies. And we did know we had seers in the last set of chapters and things like that because of Marchie. But 
And Marchie could, you know, see the future a bit, but it was never anything like a full prophecy. So now we know that there is such a thing as pro uh, full prophecies and events that are happening, and we know that Belgareth and Pol both know what this prophecy is, as well as the kings, even though we don't know anything at this moment about it. But they are setting things up, apparently, for whatever that prophecy says or is supposed to come to pass. So we're building a little bit more of this world and how the magic and the seers and things like that, what they are able to do. So they can predict the future, they can predict somebody's doom, apparently. Um, and, you know, with Margie, she could see who Garon was supposed to be, or is supposed to be, um, through her mystical sight. But we don't ever see her like do like a full long prophecy like setting out like a big magnanimous future but apparently somebody can and there is something written down or something that has been prophesized to happen in the coming time that obviously it's not too far away if they think that they're setting it up okay so now let's go ahead and talk about Belgareth now we've talked about him a little bit but I feel like Ever since the beginning or whatever, we've talked about him, and then we haven't talked about him really in depth because, you know, he's more mysterious, and there's not quite as much of him in the forefront as some of the other characters, and so there hasn't been as much substance in order for me to really delve deep on him at this point. I even feel like now, there's still so much that it's like we really don't have a concrete look at Belgareth yet. But we do have a little bit more, especially in this ending, that I felt like I wanted to talk about him a bit more, especially since he is somebody who comes from, you know, the original time that the Earth was made and uh, being one of the only magic users in existence, I feel like he deserves a little bit of time, as well as he's, you know, kind of the head of this quest. So he's mostly really mysterious at this point, super mysterious. And we don't really know much about him at all. Um, even his interactions don't really show much about him or much of emotions about him that he has. So it's really hard to go in depth at this point until we see a little bit more about him. Other than that he is wanting to do a lot of good and wanting to help protect the world, especially from you know, uh, Kaltorak and everything like that. He is a very, um, person who is very selfless in the fact that he has given his life to protecting, you know, the, the, uh, the orb and trying to make sure that, that this world can be a good world for people to live in. Um, but at this ending kind of section, we do see some more, um, revealing bits to him. And the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, for me, it's on page 240. Sorry if there's any background noise, my roommates are kind of doing some stuff over there. Um, but 240, we see Belgareth talk very minorly about Aldur, uh, who obviously is the god that gave him, you know, magical powers and was his mentor to him. And he says, let's see. Here we go. So, Mr. Wolf stood at one of the windows, looking down at the twinkling lights of Val Alorn below. I've always been fond of towers, he said almost to himself. My master lived in one like this, and I enjoyed the time I spent there. I'd give my life to have known Aldur, Chohag, Chohag said softly. Was he really surrounded by light, as some say? He seemed quite ordinary to me, Mr. Wolf said. I lived with him for five years before I even knew who he was. Was he really as wise as we're told? Anheg asked. Probably wiser, Wolf said. I was a wild and errand boy, uh, errant boy when he found me dying in a snowstorm outside his tower. He managed to tame me, though it took him several hundred years to do it. He turned from the window with a deep sigh. To work, then, he said. So we really see how fond he is of Aldur and his master. And obviously, even though he is, I believe you mentioned 7,000 years old, 
he still has very fond memories of the time when he was little and he can remember when he was little and it gives him a bit of softness a bit of uh, an approachability to him we really see that he actually misses Aldor and that he is fond of Aldor so I really liked that little piece of Belgareth that we really see a little bit of insight a little bit of softness of him we can kind of touch him almost um, and I liked the part at the end with Belgareth and the fact that he's very startled by the fact that being related to Aunt Pole, which obviously he had no problems with being like, oh yeah, your Aunt Pole is really related to you, even if it's not as strictly just an aunt. It's like great, 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 keep going, greats, aunt. Um, but she is still part of your family and she is still an aunt to you in a way. And he said, well, doesn't that make you my grandfather? Uh, several grades over. <laughs> and he's startled by the fact that that means that yes, that he is also Garon's family. And he seems rather pleased, even if it does startle him to, to know that Garon is his family and that Garon likes that he is his family. He gives them a big hug and <laughs> makes them both a little embarrassed, but it means a lot to Garon to have, to know that he has family and people who love him. And Belgareth is pleasantly surprised to think, oh yeah, I do have some family as well in Garon. Um, and then we also see when he has told this story and he mentions at the end that he sees the long view versus Pole, who is more um, personable about things. And I think that's really interesting. We kind of already have seen that with him. He's much more of the logic of uh, the two of them. He's much more of a, I'm not saying that he doesn't have any emotions or that he doesn't ever help Garon, but he's more of a, a big picture person. And we can already kind of tell that as we've gone through. And he says that even about himself is that yes, He's more of a big per, uh, picture person instead of the small, narrow, personable picture. And we're going to see how that plays out and how that helps or doesn't help in the future as we keep going forward. And he finally seems right now at the end here kind of more of a touchable character. Someone we more see uh, and know as a little more familiarly. Familiarly? We're just gonna go with that word. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's really a real world word, but I'm I'm using it and we're going with it. Let's let's keep that there. Um, but it just seems more relatable, more uh, a little bit more touchable, a little bit more like you're seeing a bit more to him than just the quest, the quest, the quest. And I find Belgareth really an interesting character as well. I mean, as we continue moving forward, we'll continue to uh, know more about him, hopefully, and he'll become even more of a solid, touchable character to us. But I'd really like to know your thoughts on Belgareth, whether you've thought he's always been touchable, whether you feel like the same, that you know, you know things about him, but you also don't know anything about him. I'd really love to hear your comments down below uh, about him and if you feel like I've missed anything in this last section about him. Okay, and then I, for the last part of talking about this particular book, I really would like to talk about Garon's progression. Because obviously we see him at the very beginning as a little boy, um, only, I think he's like five, if I remember correctly, like five or eight years old. And now we see him at the end here, still 14, but has had a lot more happen to him than he's had happen to him in his whole life. So obviously there's going to be some progression. So at Valder's farm, we kind of see him mature a bit into more of a teenager. And we get little bits and pieces of, you know, who he is and the kind of instincts that he has. But now that we see, and we've seen him this whole time, I guess we should start there. We should have seen him this whole time from there, leave his home and be that naive kid. And we still see him being a naive kid through a lot of this book. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that nobody tells him anything. And 
Part of me feels like that does a disservice to Garon by Aunt Pole. Some of the times I think maybe Aunt Pole's right. I can't know for certain. And as we continue forward, we're going to see if she was right to hold back and not tell him certain things. Or whether she should have told him certain things. We won't know until we continue forward. But at the same time, we do see he, even though he does have some growth and kind of the, um, a little bit more of you know knowledge a little bit more of his smarts coming through and connecting the dots uh, a little bit more of him learning things like the hand language that makes things more mature for him um, but we also see him very naive still and very almost rebellious because he cannot see what's happening because nobody will tell him and so it's hard for him especially as a teenager being in those kind of rebellious years that most people uh, kids have to really be like, you know, what is he supposed to do at this point? He doesn't know. He's not being told anything. He's just frustrated. He wants to be included. He's on this journey and just feels like all he is is just the kid. He doesn't have anybody else his age. He doesn't have anybody else, um, you know, going on this journey that's uh, seen as just a kid as he is. So it's hard for him. And yes, parts of this are like, okay be mature, but at the same time it's like, okay, but even adults would maybe feel uh, not making the best, to not make the best choices in the fact if that they're left out and they are left also without the information that they might need to know to make good choices. And some of it also is just he has that impulse inside him, that adult mature voice that tells him what he's supposed to be doing and he acts on that. So part of it isn't even totally uh, his choice to act uh, a certain way. Um, but then he is very, very smart and mature at times as well. We have seen those spurts where when he's got, like, uh, when he's seen Asherak or when he's seen, you know, um, what was his name? Biram. Uh, and they were hiding from him. Or whenever, like, you know, with the forest, he hides and he just listens. And there are those moments where he is that matured, um, maturity to him and that smartness to him where he can hide, he can make those good decisions in that moment and then bring it back to the group and be like, this is what I saw, this is what's happening. And he actually saves them a couple times with his uh, wandering around and his just observing things that are going on that the others would not have noticed or would not have been around to notice. So he is very smart still and does have those moments of maturity about him. And at the end here, we do see kind of an ending of maturity. We've kind of had those spurts of maturity, but here at the end, we do really see a piece of him that has more mature, that's kind of settled in, and he actually talks to Wolf, uh, or Belgareth, about his feelings. This is the first time that he's ever really expressed his feelings and been like, this is how I'm feeling and I need some clarification and some help and someone to help me figure out what I should be feeling and how I'm feeling about it. And instead of just, you know, being rebellious toward Aunt Pole, he's actually talking. And that is a very mature move on his part to actually have a conversation with someone and be like, this is how I feel and I'm not sure how to go forward. And then he actually acknowledges the fact that he might not be the most help. Obviously, Bill Gareth says that he might be more help than he thinks, but he also finally takes that moment where he's like, I know I'm just a kid. I don't know anything about fighting, you know? He doesn't express that in this moment, but it's kind of like what he's implying is he's saying, I don't know how much help I'm going to be against this thief. I'm just kind of along for the ride. And it's very mature for him to acknowledge that and to be like, hey, I'm actually, you know, Yes, he wanted to be included, but now he's like, hey, actually, I don't know how much help I'm going to be. And that's a very mature move to make. He is no longer, it seems, in denial about his Aunt Pole and about Belgareth being Polgara and Belgareth and being hundreds and thousands of years old. Um, he saw, you know, several instances of magic from Aunt Pole, especially with Mark G. Um, and giving her back her eyes, and that I think has solidified that there is no way for him to keep denying that Aunt Pole and Belgareth are who they say they are. So now we can tell that he has acknowledged it, he has accepted it, and he's okay with it. 
And then we also see that he has a new resolution, a new drive in order to avenge his parents. Now whether Belgareth is right about whether he shouldn't take the uh, wanting to kill him road or whether he should want to do that, that's uh, a different uh, part or a different uh, thought process on whether you are pro-revenge or not pro-revenge, but this is a mature moment for him to be like, I want to take responsibility for the past and on myself and to resol uh, resolve it. I want to be the one that brings justice, whatever justice he feels is right, which in this case is killing uh, the person that killed his parents, but he wants to take justice to his own hands and, you know, um, get that revenge for his parents. And that's also a very mature, you might not feel quite the same, but I feel like, uh, depending on the fact that he wants to just kill him and is, is, isn't listening to Belgareth's advice, but I do feel like in a way it's a mature move to then be like, to acknowledge his past, to accept it, and be like, I am going to be the one that decides what the, the consequences are for those who hurt me and my family. And he's not, even though he says he wants to kill him, he's not really like, outburst and vindictive and like, going on a mental like, um, uh, rage or anything like that. So that's why I feel like it's a mature moment in the fact that he takes it in and he decides I'm going to be the one to set things straight on my family's behalf. Uh, and that is what his choice is at the moment. We are going to see whether his choice is still going to be to kill that person in the end. Um, at this point, that's just what he's decided on the spur of the moment of learning about this. But either way, he is going to take the responsibility of what happened to his parents into his own hands, which is a mature move. Now let's move on to the nitty gritty. I've got three different points for the nitty gritty, um, just for us to keep in mind as we continue moving on from this book to the next book and beyond. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about, we already kind of touched on minorly, and that is that somebody has, has, somebody has talked about a prophecy. And so, what is this prophecy? We don't know anything about it. We've not even really heard of a prophecy until this moment. Um, we didn't know that there was one, um, but there is a prophecy and it seems that they are setting things up for that. But where did it come from? What is the prophecy exactly? Who are the people involved? Do we even know? Um, do Belgareth and Polgara really know or is it something more um, obscure? Do they know if it's gonna have something to do with Giron or not? we're gonna see. So let's go ahead and keep in mind that there is a prophecy and that we don't really know anything about it at this point and we're gonna have to learn more about it as we go on. Uh, second is, once again, there is mention of Garon's inheritance that they don't want him to know about at this point. Uh, Marchi has said it twice now and he really doesn't get it at this point. He doesn't understand, but um, we have had it said again, so obviously we know Garon is very important and is going to have some kind of future that is like what we thought is going to be something great and probably have to do with Cal Torak and whatever the battle is going to be between those two. So we're going to see in the future uh, what Garon's inheritance is and so let's go ahead and keep in mind that we are looking out for that. And last but not least, um, we're going to start learning about Hitar because Hitar is now joining the group. As they are exiting, they have got given Hitar a task for getting horses for them, and they're going to meet in um, their at the, meet at their meeting point in two weeks. So by the time we're on our second story, we're probably going to have much more mention of Hitar, and he's going to join the group. So let's go ahead and see what happens with Hitar. All right, so for the mention of book one, I would love it, love it, love it if you thought of uh, anything that I missed or if you wanted to have a conversation about anything I mentioned, something you're confused about, want me to elaborate more on, whatever it is, go ahead and comment down below. Uh, I would really, really love to hear from you and to have a discussion with you. That would be really great for me. So if you have any comments, questions, concerns, anything at all about Pawn of Prophecy, Go ahead and let me know. And let's go ahead and go on to kind of setting ourselves up from book one 
to book two. So first, before we actually talk about what I want to talk about content wise, let's go ahead and look at our cover here. Obviously, you might have a different cover, but this is the cover that I've got. It's a very old cover. I think I've, sorry, <laughs> I've had this for um, lots of years, like 20, no, not that many years, uh, probably 15, 15 years. So it's an old book. Um, I don't know if this is the actual original cover or not, but I do know that it is obviously an older one since I've had this book for so long. Um, but what we can see is that there's a map in the background and we've got Sindar in the background here and we've got Cherik up here. So Sindar, uh, Sindaria and Cherik up here, which is the two places that they are uh, in in this book, we've got those two parts um, that this, we actually had sectioned off in this novel as part one and part two. My guess over here, uh, you're probably guessing as well, is that this is Polgara. Uh, she does have the white strip there and she does look kind of majestic. And my guess would be that this is Garon, just since he obviously looks like a boy. So that is the guess on that. And this is the guess of it, this being Asherag and the fact that he is always thought of in the beginning as the knight in black. And even though it's kind of brownish here, he's just kind of mysterious though. He's not fully black, but he is a mysterious and he is unknown. And I would not see this as being Belgareth. Uh, he would not have the spear in the back or the armor. And I don't really see this being, you know, Brock or anything like that. Um, I think he's being left too obscure. So I would say that this is probably Asherak from when he's at the beginning visiting the farm dressed all in black. The Black Rider. So we've got that for the first one. So we've kind of seen the elements that he, uh, that David Eddings had for the cover of his first book and what happened with it. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the cover for the second book. We can see, really quick before we look, that this book is bigger than the first book. So we do have a little bit more of a meatier section here for book two than we did for book one. All right, here we go. I do like the coloring of this particular book we do see that the coloring of the map in the background that we have is different as well um i see andaria um here i also see nicaea naisa sorry naisa um and then there's one on the back here there's a place in the back but i can't read it very well with the uh, title in front of it. I'm trying to maybe let me see if I can look at the map inside and see if I can figure out what it's supposed to be. Arendia Tolnadra, I think is what's supposed to be behind here. Is Tolnadra. I'm not 100% sure though. But we do see those areas in the back, so my guess is that we're probably going to be in these areas moving forward since we had a map of zoomed in portion of the map of where we were in this one. That it's likely that. That's what that's portraying here. We've got some kind of character here that we have not met yet, or at least not one that is um, of uh, popping out at, at, at me that we have seen yet. Um, looks pretty, uh, what's the term? Oh my gosh, I'm just, my brain is just not working. Uh, kind of foresty, kind of wild. That's what I'm trying to think of. It's just very wild looking. We do have a snake here. And then it looks again that we have Polgara with her white strip of hair and probably Garon here as well. I think it's very interesting that it's mostly Garon and Polgara that are on at least the first couple of books. We don't really see any other characters at this point, and obviously we're just assuming this is Garon and the fact that he looks like he's a younger boy. Um, I would not guess that that's one of the older companions here. We do have this bird in the back too. We have this bird here. This one, we had a boar. I think that's the boar that they fight in the background here. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, 
kind of ensemble of things on the cover. And we're gonna see how things go with uh, how the stuff on the cover relates to what we read inside. If you have any guesses, go ahead and let me know. I'd love to hear any guesses that you have. Um, so it's clear so far that we were transitioning from book one into book two as the journey is going to continue. Uh, just like we did with our uh, Dragonland series, it's clear that it's going to be one epic journey through to the next book. And we're going to see where it takes us in the next round. Um, we do end with Garon accepting Paul and Belgareth. Uh, we already talked a little bit about that. Um, but it's also where we end with an important part uh, of Garon being kind of filled in a little bit. A uh, piece of his past has been set into place and that's important, I think, for Garon at that moment. It really is something that finally he just needed something. Somebody to give him something to hold on to in the midst of all this confusion and all this unknown and that no one is filling in for him. So I do think that was important that Bill Gareth did have that talk with um, with Garon. And I do think that we left it at a good, solid place where we kind of finally see a piece of the puzzle fit in. Especially with us as well being readers, even though we know more than Garon and the fact that we had that prologue and obviously as readers we can make more jumps than Garon is on what certain things mean and the narrator is obviously pointing those things out to us. Um, but it's really nice to finally have a little piece of Garon fit into place and be set. Um, Event-wise, we kind of did a, a spiral, I would say. Because we're here and we're looping around and we're coming back around to the same point, though we're not exactly in the same place. I wouldn't say we're doing a full circle because we're ending at Kamar, which is where we had kind of in the middle of the book. So we're not starting off in the exact same place. We are going looping back around a little bit to where we were before, but we're also not starting off with the same information as we had before. We've learned some more. Garon's matured a little bit. There's been events that have happened that have progressed along and has changed the characters before when they were there. Um, Barak had not had his doom. They had not known anything about much about Asherak. Um, Garon didn't know anything about his past. And so we're looping back around, but we have had some growth and some important events happen in the meantime. So we're not coming back at the exact same place. Hopefully this will set them up to be in a place where they can go forward better, that they can really move forward with more confidence, with more surety, with a little bit more growth and be in a place that can help set them up for success. We're going to see what happens if that's actually the case, but that is the hope, of course, that they are in a place that's more secure and able to make them move forward. And what do you feel that the title means for this book? It is The Queen of Sorcery. Now, in my opinion, this would be talking about Holgara. Now, we don't know if that actually is going to be what it means, considering we haven't read what the book is about yet. But so far, the only sorceress that I know is Polgara. But what will that mean about Polgara? It's not sure at that uh, at any point. So we don't really know. And, and maybe this, whoever this woman is on here, this wild looking woman, she's kind of sitting like she's sitting on a throne. So maybe this will be the queen of sorcery or have herself labeled as such we're not sure but so far queen of sorcery does make me think of polgara i don't know what it makes you think of whether you think it will be polgara whether it'll be this lady whether it'll be somebody else and really we won't know until we read it but i do find it interesting in the fact that i'm not really sure uh who the pawn of prophecy is from book one I would really like to have your feedback on this. This is something that I really feel kind of stumped on, is that the first one is called Pawn of Prophecy. And we did hear about a prophecy. And we do know that Garon is probably gonna be an important person. And you would think, at least I think, that you would 
that you would think, <laughs> or that it would be, you know, kind of easy to think that Geron is the pawn of prophecy. But a pawn is somebody to be moved around and to be positioned into a place, something that is not acting on their own. Um, at this point, Geron hasn't done anything prophetic, and it seems more like we're setting things up. Not that we're actually getting things into place yet, but we are trying to like set things up, so I'm not 100% sure what the title meant for this particular volume. Who do you think the pawn was? Or do you think the pawn was something, you know, more, not a person, but more of a thing or more of an event or, or what? I'm not sure. I can't totally say what the pawn of prophecy meant for this book. That one stumps me a little bit. So I would really, really love to hear your opinions on what you think the title meant for this book now that we've read it. What do you think that that was trying to lead us to or why it would be called that? Queen of Sorcery seems a little bit easier. At least there are some options that maybe there is a Queen of Sorcery um, going to be in this novel or that it could be relating to Pull or it could be relating to both. We're going to see. But it does seem like this might be a little bit easier to figure out or to have a little bit more of a hint, 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 nudge, nudge toward what we think this book might entail because of that title. But we will just have to see for certain. Okay. Let me just double check my notes to make sure I'm not missing anything I wanted to say. Nope, I feel like that was pretty good. Okay. So for the next Belgarid class that we're gonna have, go ahead and read the beginning. Um, to all the way through chapter five. So chapters one through five plus the prologue, because we have another prologue here. We do have another map at the beginning. And uh, yeah, we will go ahead and go from there once uh, we have our next class. So yeah, chapters one through five, including the prologue, which for me is pages one through 63. Okay. I hope that you enjoyed this class today, as always, and as I have mentioned earlier in this video and many times before, please, 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 if you have anything you'd like to discuss, anything you'd like to talk about, anything at all, I would really love to hear it down below. Or you're also welcome to contact me on Twitter, which is at fantasyfiction1. If Twitter doesn't work for you, go ahead and reach out on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash fantasyfiction1 one or you're welcome to check out my blog uh, it has lots of different content on there we've got uh, book reviews we've got recommendations we've got you know different deliberations where I talk about things that I think about fantasy topics you're always welcome to let me know what you'd like to see on there as well uh, any topics you'd like me to discuss anything you would like to know about recommendation wise uh, I have more than just books I also have um, a couple posts about movies or TV series, um, and I'm continuing to add more. I've got some uh, personal accounts of uh, my favorite uh, books, as well as, you know, how I got into fantasy, all that stuff. So if you're interested in any of that, or if you wish to contact me, you can also contact me on there. So go ahead and go to fantasyfictionfanatics.net to contact or me there or to see any of that on there. Uh, you can also email me, whatever works best for you. I would just love, love, love to have a conversation with you and a discussion and to talk about fantasy together with you. Let me know if you want any videos, any character analysis, writing, uh, any writing videos. Actually, I know I haven't done as many of those lately and I'm sorry, I will get to them eventually, I promise. Or if any books in the future that you would like me to cover, I'd love to have your input. I guess I will see you guys next time. <laughs> Bye!